The path we're following has eight folds or eight factors, but there's a unity to the factors. When the Buddha talks about entering the stream, it's when all the factors flow into one another and really do become one. But even in the beginning, as you start out practicing, you can see that there's a smooth progression. And it's not one step and then another step, but it's one step and then it gets included in the next, and these get included in the next and spread out their influence. And they all get wrapped up together. You start out with right view. And even before right view, there are certain qualities you want to bring. Generosity is one of them, in the sense that you're happy to give, you're happy to share. You see that there's a definite quality of mind that's developed that's really worthwhile as you share. Because in the practice, it is a kind of sharing. You're sharing your energy for the purpose of a happiness that's not going to harm anyone else, and that you will have something to offer to others. When the Buddha talks about the motivations for practicing, one of them is that if you're a monk and you reach the end of the path, the gifts given by those who have been supporting you will bear them great fruit. So this is your way of making sure that they benefit from their gifts. It's by practicing this. So there's an element of generosity. You're not going to let yourself get slack because you realize that other people's happiness depends on you're completing the path. And the willingness to engage in deferred gratification. In other words, you're not going to go for the quick fix. You're going to go for a means of happiness that may take longer to show its results, but is totally harmless all around. That quality of mind is important to bring to the path. In fact, when the Buddha prepares people to understand the Four Noble Truths and the elements of right view, he starts out with generosity, builds up through virtue, the rewards of these activities, and then there are limitations. And simply being generous, being virtuous is not enough. There's more that needs to be done. And learning how to renounce your ordinary, everyday types of happiness. And seeing renunciation as a good thing, which is quite an accomplishment in our culture. But learning how to see renunciation as a good thing, that's what prepares you for right view. So when we think about developing the different perfections, such as generosity, goodwill, these are not simply decorations that sit around outside the path. They actually are preparations for the state of mind that you need in order to practice. And to accept the fact that the Four Noble Truths, which are the heart of right view, really do focus on the main issue in life, which is that we're causing suffering. We don't have to. There's a way that we can stop causing that suffering. And then we learn how to understand the other factors of the path as well. That's part of the understanding, part of the view. And then we begin to act on them. But to act on them, you need the right motivation. Once you understand cause and effect, it's not enough simply to understand cause and effect. You decide that you want to avoid things that are harmful and develop good qualities. That's what right resolve is all about. You learn how to make up your mind that you will engage in renunciation. And renunciation here is a factor that starts with simple everyday sensual thinking, the kind of fantasizing we like to do about food, things that we like to look at, things we like to listen to, things we like to touch. All the fantasies that go on in the mind surrounding sensual pleasures. You realize it might be a good thing to get your mind above and beyond all that. 
that's one way of dealing with the, the cause of suffering, which, of course, there's craving for sensuality. And then you develop, develop the resolve not to harm the resolve, not to bear ill will. These two are related to goodwill and compassion. These are part of your motivation based on right view. And then it goes through your actions, speech, the things you do with the body, the way you develop your livelihood. You look for ways in which you're doing harm through your speech, and you realize, okay, there's, there's harm in lying, there's harm in divisive speech, there's harm in abusive speech, there's harm in idle chatter, sitting around and talking and talking and talking with no clear purpose in mind. If nothing else, it wastes a lot of time. So what you're doing is you're taking your right resolve and you're applying it to the area of speech. You want to learn how to avoid these harmful kinds of speech. Then you do the same with your actions. You avoid killing, you avoid stealing, you avoid illicit sex, because these things are harmful. You try to avoid harmful forms of livelihood. So what you're doing is you're carrying right resolve into your daily life. really looking at the way you live to see if it's in line with the understanding that comes with the Four Noble Truths. That if you give into craving and clinging and ignorance, you're going to give rise to suffering. And if you learn how to avoid harm, you're more and more on the path. It's from here that we start going into the mind directly, because you realize that all your actions come from where? They come from the mind, the qualities of the mind. So right effort starts with generating desire to prevent unskillful qualities from arising, as we chanted just now. To abandon them if they have arisen, to give rise to skillful qualities, and then when skillful qualities have come, then you try to maintain them. That generating desire there relates back to right resolve. We're taking our right resolve and now we're applying it directly to the qualities of the mind. We try to be intent, we try to be focused on what we're doing. In other words, it's not only while we're sitting here with our eyes closed, but as you go through the day, look at what you're doing. Look at the qualities of the mind that you're acting on, and which qualities are you allowing to sit around in the mind that really shouldn't be there? And which ones do you want to give rise to? And once they've come, it's not a matter of just watching them come and go. You actually want to develop them. So that's what right effort is all about, and the desire and the effort and the intentness. These are three of the bases of success. And of course, there's, this is all based on the understanding of what's skillful and what's not. That's the, the wisdom faculty there in right effort. Right effort is not so much a question of how much effort you're putting in, although that is one of the factors, one of the dimensions of right effort. But it's a dimension of wisdom, a dimension of understanding. This goes back to right view. So right effort has to contain right view in order to be right effort. And it contains right resolve right there in generating the desire to do these things properly. Now to maintain this effort, the mind needs to be solidly est established to gain the strength that comes from good concentration. So the first thing you've got to do is find a place to establish it, and this is what the Four frames of reference are the four establishings of mindfulness, or four. You have to keep something in mind in order to get the mind concentrated. So, as the Buddha says, you keep the body in and of itself in mind, or feelings in and of themselves, mind states, mental qualities in and of themselves. You keep those things in mind. 
And then you bring the qualities of mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. Mindfulness is that keeping in mind. Alertness is watching what's actually going on. Ardency is the element of right effort brought into this. Remember, right effort also contains right view. It's there in the ardency that the previous factors of the path get contained in right mindfulness. It's like right effort is the kernel here, and then mindfulness surrounds it, the flesh of the fruit. Or it takes that element of right view through right, right effort and gives it a place to stand. The alertness watches to make sure that you're actually doing this right and gauging your, the results of your actions. This is where, again, right view comes in as you evaluate things as to whether they're helping or not. This is the skillful use of judgment. The term judging mind has so much bad press here in America, especially in Dharma circles, where it really shouldn't. There's skillful judging and unskillful judging. We're trying to engage in skillful judging, which is you're focusing on actions and the results, not so much on what kind of person you are, but what the action is and whether it's getting the results you want. If it's not getting the results you want, you go back and you try to figure something else Figure something else out. What would be a better approach? It's not the judgment of a judge in a court trying to assign guilt or innocence. It's more the judgment of a craftsperson working on a project and realizing, hey, something's not going quite right here. We've got to go back and change what we're doing. And that's the factor that develops into evaluation. The mindfulness develops into directed thought, and this is how right mindfulness flows smoothly into right concentration. As the Buddha said, the four establishing of mindfulness are the themes of right concentration. So here we have another kernel within a kernel. The right effort is the kernel within right mindfulness, and right mindfulness is the kernel within right concentration. You might think of it as a pearl. You've got right view there as that little grain of sand over which all these other layers are, are created that gather around. And so when your right concentration is directed by right view and right resolve, and there's also a direct connection between concentration and right resolve. Because remember, part of the right resolve is to abandon sensuality. And it's only when you really got the mind in a good, solid state of concentration that it really is above its sensual concerns. The happiness of concentration is said to be a happiness of form, or a pleasure of form, i.e. the body as you sense it from within. And it's only when you have this this kind of pleasure, this kind of refreshment, that you really can learn how to go beyond your sensual concerns. As the Buddha says, if you don't have this higher form of pleasure, this more refined, this deeper form of pleasure, then no matter how much you understand the sensuality and the types of thinking that goes into sensuality are unskillful, you're still going to go back to them, because the mind is always looking for pleasure. And you can't wait until you finish the path to finally say, okay, now I've got a reward. The right concentration is what gives you the energy you need in order to carry through the work of right, right view and right resolve. And that's what it shows. That as you get the mind in a concentration and settle, it, settle in, and then you're looking for even deeper sense of peace deeper sense of solidity, this is when you start noticing that even the factors of right concentration are fabricated. They come and they go. There's a level of stress that rises and falls. And you can notice this either as you're in a particular state of concentration or as you move from one to another. And you begin to notice that in moving, say, from one level of jhana to another, the, the sense of the breath changes. The activity, or the level activity in the mind changes. And you notice that the deeper level has less stress, less disturbance. 
This is the application of right view in the right concentration. So it's not the case that the eight factors of the path are like eight different courses of study. You study biology, and then you go study English, and then you go study social sciences. And what you learn in biology doesn't really apply to English, and what you learn in English doesn't apply to the social sciences all that much. That's not the way the, the path goes. Each of the factors is intimately connected with all the others, and there is a progression. It's not by accident that Buddha always says everything starts with the right view. Because right view is what directs all the other activities. So learn to see them as all containing one another, or the right concentration is containing right view all the way up through right mindfulness. So the path really can come to oneness. And it's when all the factors are coming together that they really have strength. They can finally break through to something that's not fabricated. In fact, all the elements of the path, starting with generosity all the way on up, are all expressions of the same thing. As Lumpudun once said, it's one path from the very beginning all the way up to the top. And John Mahabhava said some, in a similar vein, that when you gain awakening, you realize this is connected back to that generosity. There's a clear line of connection all the way through all the factors of the path, all the qualities that surround and underlie the path. It's all one thing, all clear through. Keeping this in mind helps keep you focused. So you're not a mother chicken running around after her baby chicks. Well, it's not like putting crabs in a basket. You throw a couple crabs in, then you get the next crab, and the first two crabs are already crawled out. That's not the way the path is, or that's the way it, sh that's the way it shouldn't be. When you're really on the path, everything is gathered together right here into one. And it's when it's one that it has strength. <laughs>